What a beautiful morning. It's great to see you all. My name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here. And I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. And it's great to be here again. Um, quick announcement. If your wallet feels a little lighter, we did find a little cash. And I know it's not offering time and the plates are up here, so you might have missed the spot, but it's okay. Uh, if you are missing some cash, please come and find David, either during Passing the Peace or afterward. Uh, just tell him how much you're missing, <laughs> and then he can verify. Uh, but yeah, I just want to say congrats, North Lincoln High School football. Uh, I know they had a little nice win to start their season, and it's okay. I know you college football fans are probably concerned about my health and well-being after my Knowles uh, did not do so well yesterday, but it's okay. But one thing I'm glad, it is fall. It is beautiful, and it's wonderful to be here and worship our Lord and Savior with you all. Um, we have a couple of announcements for you. We have an announcement video. Awesome. Well, let's take that. <laughs> Here are this morning's announcements. This is your friendly reminder to please take a moment to locate the friendship pad on the end of the pew or row where you are sitting this morning and fill it out. While doing this, be sure to see who else is sitting next to you and take a moment to introduce yourself. Calling all men. Our quarterly men's breakfast is happening this Saturday, August 31st, from 8 to 10 a.m. in the FLC, during which time the men will participate in a special service project of trimming the crepe myrtle trees in our parking lot. Special note, please plan on bringing your tree trimming tools and some work gloves. Come and enjoy some free food and fellowship. This men's breakfast occurs on the fifth Saturday of the month. Our DUMC church office will be closed on Monday, September 2nd for the Labor Day holiday. We will resume normal office hours on Tuesday. It's that time again. First Thursday lunch is back on Thursday, September 5th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. You are invited to stop by at lunch and enjoy some chicken pie or baked spaghetti and yummy dessert. You are also invited to come and help pick chicken on Wednesday, September 4th at 10 a.m. in the FLC. No experience necessary. Calling all Harbor Youth. The Harbor Youth kickoff for the 24-25 season happens on Sunday, September 8th from 6 to 8 p.m. in the FLC. Set a reminder and plan to come. Tons of exciting things coming up, and uh, I hope you're pumped. I hope you're pumped for the season that's uh, that's coming for uh, in front of us. And thank you, Aaron, for always making those um, fun to watch. And uh, yeah, if you could turn to this morning's greeting and read what in, what is in bold. 
Whom do you seek here in this place? We seek God, the creator who brought us to life. Who has told you of God? Jesus Christ, God's son, has shown us the love of God through his life. Discipleship is difficult. Are you ready? We want to be ready, Lord. Strengthen and sustain us. In this day. Let's pray together. Holy God, in the beauty of this place, we have come to pray, to worship, to receive healing and hope. We come from the struggles and triumphs of this week, needing to feel the soothing presence of God. Lord, be with us this day. Calm and soothe our souls. Remind us that you provide a special place where we can sing your praises and be empowered to go forth to serve you. Amen. And now if you are able, stand and pass the peace to one another saying hi. Good morning. My name is Pastor David Washko, and I welcome you to this service of our sanctuary service at 11 o'clock. For all of those of you who are watching online, we want to thank you for being part of our service today and invite you to come to our website and see all the activities that we have going on. We hope you enjoy this morning's message, which will be a recap of our 10-week sermon series on discipleship. Blessings. be seated. What a beautiful song and powerful lyrics and how much we have to depend on his amazing grace. And I pray that we do uh, indeed follow him all the way. So we don't always do that though, if we're honest. Uh, we oftentimes fall short, sometimes even daily fall short in following God's promptings and guidance where we need to go. So let us together confess and be pardoned by his amazing grace. Patient Lord, we are a culture that wants the quick and easy answers to all of life's problems. Forgive us, Lord, when we are so impatient. The words of Jesus take time for us to comprehend. Push us in our ministry of 
help and compassion to do more than we ever thought we could do in helping others. Give to us that extra measure of faith and commitment that we may truly serve you by serving others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So just hear this, this that Scripture says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, proving his love for you. And, and you are forgiven for those trespasses, for those debts, for those sins that, that you have uh, not been fully obedient uh, of following God's will and God's prompting in your life. So let us rest and soak that in as we pray once more. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for never giving up on us, for always having a plan to work things out for good. And Lord, I pray that we would have the courage to muster up the faith to trust you in all circumstances, that we would love you and, and worship you and you alone, that you would take top priority in all of our minds and our hearts and our practices, that we would give more attention and more focus into what you're calling us to do than what we just will to happen. So I thank you again for, for proving your love for us, for dying on that cross in our place, that, that you also didn't let sin and death hold you down, but you, you the author of creator, uh, author and creator of all things, you came back to life to prove your God. And I thank you so much for doing that and promising us that place our faith in you also to be resurrected and with you for eternity in glory. And uh, I just thank you again for the opportunity we have to serve in this community. Help us live into that with our lifestyles and with our choices and with the self-sacrificial love that it takes to do so. Help us live out the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Service is a big part of our culture here and it is only possible because people like you and you yourselves have given your resources, your time, your energy. And in fact, we had a team of people come just yesterday here to harvest, um, sort of uh, a huge harvest. Uh, we actually had one sweet potato that my son pulled out with the help of some adults. That was four pounds, one sweet potato that was as big as his head. Uh, it's incredible what God can do out there. And so, uh, but I think altogether, I think the harvest was 77 pounds, 77 pounds of food just yesterday taken out of that garden that is going to serve, going to feed um, children and adults in this neighborhood, in this community that, that need it. And so we're blessed to be part of this church that focuses and uh, intentionally serves so many in so many different ways. So thank you for doing that. And now it's time to worship for today with today's offering. Elias, could you come forward and ushers come forward and let us worship in that way.
cause of this life All your mercies in disguise We pray for wisdom Your voice to hear We cry in anger when We cannot feel you near We doubt your goodness We doubt your love As if every promise from your word is not of this life all your mercies in disguise when friends betray us when darkness seems so when we know the pain reminds his heart that this is not this is not This world can satisfy And what if trials of this life The rain, the storms, the hardest nights Are your mercies in disguise
God's word. This morning's scripture comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 22 Old Testament and Ephesians 4, 11, 16. Hear the good news. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quelch the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Until we all attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sean. Good morning. I love how Pastor Ben said, uh, welcome to the fall. Welcome, this morning was fall-like. Anyone from North Carolina knows, don't fall for it, right? <laughs> the 90s are coming right back, people. So let us pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the cool temperatures this morning, but even more importantly, thank you that we got to be part of witnessing your creation. Just coming outside and seeing the moon, Father, seeing the cool air, seeing uh, just the life that is going on all around us. That is your gift, your gift to us, your way of showing us that you are God Almighty, creator of everything, and that you are pursuing us asking us to join you. You don't need us. You don't need anything. Yet you are pursuing us and asking us, not telling us, not even begging us. You're asking us out of love to join you in growing your kingdom and furthering your kingdom and growing the adoption rate, Father, into your kingdom. Thank you for that privilege. May we all see it as a privilege. We have experienced it ourselves if we are all believers, Father. And so may we share that incredible privilege with the ones that we love who have yet to know your love. We ask all these things in your name, Lord. Amen. So this morning is the last sermon of the sermon series of Come and Go. Yesterday, I heard a pretty neat quote from somebody when I was in a long meeting yesterday. And he said, as disciples, we are not called to be successful. That's the first half of what he said. And you think about it, in our world, anytime we attempt something, we always attach failure and success to it. Right? Did I fail? Did I succeed? Whatever it is, we attempt. Christianity is not that way. So as disciples, we are not called to be successful. Matter of fact, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where the word successful is attached to the experience of discipleship. But we are called to be faithful. That is all throughout God's word. From an outsider's perspective, it could be said that this religious thing, this church thing, looks more like a transaction than a transformation, right? 
people hear about, okay, what does it take to become a believer? And we're told that, well, you need to believe in the virgin birth. You need to believe that God showed up in the flesh as Jesus, that he lived a sinful life. He died a substitutionary death, meaning he went to the cross for our sins, that he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he will return. If you believe that and give your life to Christ, you get the golden ticket. Remember the golden ticket? And you get to go to heaven. Well, that's not what this is all about, right? It's not about a transaction. And it looks like sometimes that God is just simply asking for us to do that. And then he's simply saying, please come to church, go to church, attend, meet others, have some fellowship with other Christians, serve in my name when and where you can. We know that's really not what this is about, that this is not a transaction. This is supposed to be a transformation for all of us. So what did Jesus say? Well, we always hear about this great commission. We hear about Matthew, and you always hear Matthew 19 and 20, right? These two verses. And ironically, we typically don't even finish reading or stating what verse 20 is. But I'm not one just to pick out a couple verses, so let's read the whole context where Matthew 28, 16 through 20 explains what Jesus says we are to do. And Jesus is speaking to the disciples, and it says, it is written, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. Now, this is cool, I think. The word doubtful. This is the disciples. Some of the disciples, who we we would not think, are actually doubtful. This, to me, tells you about the integrity of Scripture, of what Matthew is writing is transparency and filled with honesty. Because if you were writing a story, you would not admit the heroes of the story or the important figures of the story are showing doubt, especially on a monumental moment like this when Jesus is speaking to them. So I see this as integrity of the scripture. So we hear that they doubt. And then Jesus says, and he came up to them and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And most of the time that's where it ends. And you could argue back to me and say, well, David, Jesus is speaking to the disciples. This is what he's telling them they are to go do. But if we do continue reading, we find out that we, as believers, are pulled into this picture because it says, not only in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then it says to the disciples, you are to be teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always and to the end of the age. So it's not just the disciples. We are wrapped into this as believers that we are to be doing everything that he commanded the disciples to do. And the great news of this is Jesus says in his own words and promise that he is with us always even to the end. So if we are to be like disciples... What does that look like? And that's what we've been discussing the last 10 weeks. We've been going into what is a disciple and, and trying to get our entire congregation on the same page because we discussed when we started this 10 weeks ago, had I asked you what is a disciple and 100 people responded, we get 100 different answers. And so that was a litmus test of demonstrating that not just this church, but the church body has lost sight as to what a disciple is. And so we as a church congregation are spearheading and bringing back this movement of not us just being a great church of filled with service, but let us be a church that is answering the call of Jesus with the Great Commission. And so, what does a true disciple look like? And we discussed that this is the basic definition. If we were all on board and we all had this definition in mind together, that this would give us something to unify around. And as one who follows Christ, grows in Christ, serves in Christ, and shares in Christ. And we broke through that it's not one who just learns about Christ, but truly it's one who learns how to be like Christ. And that's a big difference. 
And then we talked about, well, what does a disciple do? Well, it's one who is intentionally equipping believers with the word of God through accountable relationships that is empowered by the Holy Spirit to replicate, just like we just read in the last half of the Great Commission, faithful followers of Jesus Christ. This is what we are supposed to be doing as a church body. And Jesus mentions that there's two steps towards true discipleship. One is to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and then also one who abides in Jesus' words and teachings. So we're to become a learner, to be like Christ, and we are to model an apprentice. That's the second part. We're not to leave that out. That's the part that we typically have left out, and this church is going to elevate and bring back to the movement of discipleship. So, what is it to be a true disciple that Jesus mentions? If there's a true disciple, then obviously people have, there's some people who don't understand what a true disciple is. And so we needed to go into what a true disciple looks like. And there's four things that must take place in order for us to be an effective disciple. And so we covered that the first one is we need to know what our God-given purpose is. There's no way around it. God has given each of us individually a purpose in serving him, serving part of our church. And the truth of the matter is, until we know what our individual God-given purpose is, it's hard to say and admit, but we are nothing but a wandering generality. That's the truth. If we don't act on our God-given purpose, we're just going through doing what we think God is asking of us. We need to step into being a meaningful, specific, which is understanding what each of our God-given purposes are. And there's great benefit to knowing what God's given purpose is. Who wouldn't want to know clarity and direction in their life? Have enhanced motivation and passion, deepened spiritual connection, increased sense of identity and self-worth, greater impact on others, peace and contentment, balanced priorities, resilience and strength, legacy and eternal impact, and joy and fulfillment. All of this comes when you you are confident in knowing what your God-given purpose is. And so we provided you a stepping stone to get started, a PDF, a workbook to get started to know what your God-given talent is or purpose is. Excuse me. There's still some more in the back if you would like to get started on that part of your journey. Your creator has hand-woven you. And God didn't just hand wove, weave each of us and then just go on and is working with other people. No, he's still pursuing you. He's created you and he's pursuing you and he wants us all to know what our God-given purpose is so we can unify together as a congregation and carry forward his kingdom. You've heard me say it many times and you'll hear me say it many more. You were created on purpose for a purpose and that the purpose of life is to have a life of purpose. So that's number one that you have to have in order for us to be an effective disciple. The second thing, we need to identify our spiritual gifts. Henry Blackaby quoted, a church needs to learn to function as the body of Christ. Each one of us as believers is an important part of this body. And until we know what our spiritual gift is or gifts, we are not being the most effective disciple we can be. David Jeremiah has a great podcast on this that he just uh, came out this past Thursday on. You can just type in Google or whatever, David Jeremiah Thursday podcast, uh, last Thursday's date, and you will hear a great message on spiritual gifts. And David says this, because up until the point that we know what our spiritual gifts are, we're just showing great intentions. And he says, the truth is, until you can state the spiritual gifts given to you by God, you are serving the way you intend, not necessarily how God intended. See, when you identify your spiritual gifts, it's a starting point to grow and serve God in the way he intended. 
Our church does a phenomenal job serving in this community. But if we're serving in a way that's not our, using our spiritual gift, then we're not being as effective for Christ in the kingdom as we could be. We offered on, in the newsletter and online, there's a free assessment that you can take, it takes 10 minutes to find out the starting path of what your spiritual gifts are. And I still encourage that. There's a pamphlet in the back that encourages what those spiritual gifts look like. And we encourage you to know what your spiritual gifts are. And then also on the uh, PDF handout, we have different areas in the church, in the community, where you can at least invest into looking and using your spiritual gift. If we start saying right now without knowing our spiritual gifts, you know, I, I, I do this for the church, I do this in the community, God has used me in this manner. If we keep using the word I, we're missing the mark. It's not about what you're doing. It should be about what we are accepting. We need to remember that discipleship is not what God wants from us. It's what he wants for us. So we need to know our God-given purpose. We need to know our spiritual gifts to reach this true discipleship. Then we need to understand and be able to understand and discern God's voice. Think about all the scripture stories that we've ever been exposed to. All the scripture stories we've ever read. And in the entire Bible, I cannot find a single story where somebody's going on a lifelong journey trying to discover the meaning of life and find God. From front to cover, the whole entire Bible shows stories of God pursuing us, coming after us. He's not hard to find. He makes himself available in every way possible. It's not about us going on a long search journey. God is showing up. He's pursuing us. And we even talked about the story of Samuel and Eli. To emphasize this, Samuel, who's growing up under the tutelage of Eli in the temple, and, and Samuel's trying to be a priest, and he's wearing the clothes of a priest. He's taking on the duties of a priest. He's even sleeping next to the Ark of the Covenant and God calls on him and he doesn't know it's God. And so what does God do? He doesn't stop. He pursues after him and calls on him four total times. And we're told that Eli, or excuse me, Samuel didn't know it was God because he only knew of God. He didn't know God. And it wasn't until after this fourth time and this fourth call and he accepted it that he started beginning to know who God was. So God shows up in multiple ways. Through prayer, through scripture, through the Holy Spirit, through creation, through nature. He speaks through us through community, through other people, through music, through worship, through providential circumstances. This is a God who loves us so much, he offers so many ways for us simply to open our eyes and listen, and he's there. So, we need to know our purpose, we need to know what our spiritual gift is, we need to be able to discern God and how he predominantly speaks to us. And then lastly, we need to understand the importance of how to build authentic relationships, which we recently talked about. You know community is vital when the creator of all, who doesn't need a thing from us, originates and creates community. It's called the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's how we know it's so important when God is living in community and demonstrating to us community. We've talked about that community is so important that we need this, we should uh, discuss the sin of the desert, knowing where the water is and not sharing it with others, or in this case, knowing where the living water is and not sharing where it is. There are people that we love that are walking around in the desert. Some may be never finding water. Some may find water, but guess what? If it's not the living water, it's contaminated water. We have loved ones who are drinking contaminated water because they haven't found the living water yet. Let's be that 2 a.m. brother, that 2 a.m. sister to loved ones, to friends, to those in the community. So who can you be that 2 a.m. brother or sister to? If 
you don't have someone, or you're looking for a 2 a.m. brother or sister. There's a, a group organization called the Emmaus Walk that's coming up. It was posted in the newsletter this past week. Um, they'll be gathering this October. They meet twice a year. One weekend is for men, one weekend is for women. This is an experience of a lifetime of finding 2 a.m. brothers or being a 2 a.m. brother and having an incredible experience of growing your relationship with God. And so I promote that to you to look that up in the newsletter. It is a powerful uh, weekend. I've gone to it twice, I've spoken to it twice, and I have witnessed miraculous relationships formed. I met one gentleman this past time who was struggling, um, had been out of the military recently, was missing his brothers and sisters from the military, went through this weekend and he blew me away when on Sunday morning he said to me, in this one weekend he grew closer to these people than he did his entire unit. And I called him out on that. I said, there's no way. You've, bond, you've bonded with those people in, the, in your unit. And he said, no, this weekend I bonded deeper than I've ever bonded with anybody. This is a powerful time. So if you're looking for a starting place for authentic relationships, check out the newsletter, check out the Mayus Walk. So for 10 weeks, I've been pitching to you my sales spiel on the importance of discipleship. I've been making a sales call to the church every, mo every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., pitching a message, giving you the features and advantages and benefits of the importance of discipleship. Anyone who knows in sales, especially when you are doing long-term sales, big six-figure contracts, Wally, you could testify, right? You better have a sales cycle and understand your sales cycle. You better know how to pre-call plan. You better know how to prospect, to gain an appointment with the decision maker, to provide needed analysis, then to provide your solution to the problem, to make the close, and then to nurture the client. Where I differ a little bit in my sales career, I didn't make the big close at the very end. I felt there was too much pressure and too much uh, rejection that way. So I continuously made all throughout the sales call minor closes all throughout the process. So that's why over the last 10 weeks, every week, I will ask you questions, questions to bring you closer to hopefully making that decision, making that movement to wanting to become a true disciple. So that when we come to this 10th week like we are today, it's not that big of a pitch, not that big of a close. So this morning I was thinking about this and uh, I was thinking about all of my entire career and all the great accomplishments and uh, all the big closes and multi-million dollar contracts and six-figure contracts and I remember pushing them across the table and telling them, hey, press hard, you're signing through three copies, right? Close the deal. And then God humbled me, big time. Because he said, David, everything you got on your office wall, all your shelves, everything that you think you've accomplished, when it's said and done, means nothing. He said, today's your close. There's no greater close to, than today's close. Asking my people to become true disciples and impacting my kingdom. And he humbled me big time through that because that is the truth. Discipleship is a decision. And we had a graph where we showed the, the divergent road. One road is a path of least resistance and the other one is the discipleship road. And yes, some people choose that path of least resistance because they don't think they're ready, they don't think they have the time, they don't think they can take on the challenge, there's too many obstacles. And I told you that that is nothing but a save now, pay later delusion. Because whether you take that path or the discipleship path, you are going to be challenged. So the series, this whole series has had some goals. And I've been up front with you about what the close was going to be. I told you that number one, I would love for our church to get involved with small groups, whether it's dinner groups, whether it's life groups, whether it's coming to church on Wednesday nights and being part of the new soup and scripture and fellowship where we're having dinner together from 5.30 to roughly seven o'clock, 
where it's just about fellowship. We'll have a 10 minute devotion, then time to discuss with one another the devotion or what's going on in our lives. It's all about fellowship. Um, we've talked about that there is going to be, and it's already set up for Wednesday, September 18th, a discipleship leadership experience where we will go through this inf this material these four points that I just brought up in depth where at the end of the 10 weeks experience you will know what your God given talent is you will know what your spiritual gift is you will know how God is speaking to you and hopefully you will be involved in even more authentic relationship and not only during this experience will you gain all of that but I call it disciple or leadership discipleship experience because I believe Leadership and discipleship are very much in the same family. And so you will also learn things about leadership that you will be able to use in your everyday lives. Because if we are going to share our faith, there's things we need to know. We need to understand conflict management. We need to understand how to be good listeners. We need to understand how to effectively read the person that we're witnessing to or talking to or just building community with. You know, if you are somebody who is auditory or tactile, um, I can't, if you're auditory and I keep saying to you, do you see what I'm saying? Do you see where I'm going with this? We're not effectively communicating. I need to be saying, do you hear what I'm saying? Because you're an auditory person. If you are somebody who's a driver or an amiable or an expressive or analytical, if you're a driver, you want information in bullet points. If I talk to you in an expressive manner, telling you stories, we're not communicating on an effective level. And so these are things that you will pick up on in this class and learn so you can improve communication and build a much more authentic, deeper relationship. So these are things that we will be experiencing during this 10-week leadership discipleship experience. You might say, I don't know if I can afford to take the time to do this, or Wednesday nights aren't a good night for me. Well. This is so important to me that we as a church move forward. I want to make time during the week. If Wednesday nights don't work, I will set up times for people to meet one-on-one -on -one so that we can walk through this together one-on-one -on -one in a discipleship fashion. Is there a cost to discipleship? Yes. That's the truth. There is. But here's the good news. Jesus paid the price on the cross so we can endure the cost of following him. But the great news about that is, yes, there's a cost, but think of all that we're given to endure through this cost. Because when we give our life to Christ, we're given the first of our inheritance, the Holy Spirit. Which means when we're given the Holy Spirit, we're given God's promises. Which means we get to live in eternity with him, which starts right now. Which also means we're given the fruit of the Spirit. Which also means we're given the armor of God. Which also means that we're given the opportunity for authentic relationships. Which also means we're given his abundance of mercy and grace. We're given all of this. All of it. I think it's worth the cost of us being his disciples. So, I started this whole entire series with the question, are you trying to be a Christian without being a disciple? Only you can answer that question. But again, I'll tell you the absolute truth based upon scripture. You can't be a Christian without being a true disciple. So, my final close and pitch and question is this. Is today going to be your day one to be an intentional disciple, a true disciple to God, or is it just going to be another one day? Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you pursue us and do not stop. You take us right where we are in our lives. You don't ask us to become something better than we already are. You take us right where we are. But you love us enough not to leave us there. You want us to grow in love with you, to grow and look more like your son. And so we thank you that you give us this book of love letters, this handwritten book by you, Father, so that we can know you, we can know your son, we can know the Trinity, Father. Lord, thank you that you love us this much. 
I thank you for this church, this congregation that you have assembled together, Father. Help us to work together as a congregation to further your kingdom, to adopt more members into the Christian family, Father. Use us. Use us as vessels. May we be brave, willing, faithful, and bold. Amen. of action. This church clearly shows evidence of action. You have a pastoral staff, you have an entire church staff that I can testify demonstrates evidence of how much they love you and love this church. So know that you're loved and let us go out those doors and show the evidence to others that they are loved. Amen.